<laughs> okay, so just just hold that in mind because uh, you may it may be a useful reference point to what Robin has to say and what follows in the discussion. So, in terms of the format of the evening, I'm going to introduce Robin in a minute and then do a very short interview, asking one or two questions on your behalf, as it were. Robin will then give his his lecture, probably around about 45 minutes, something like that. And then we're delighted that we have two people who've offered to join a panel to give a response to it: Bill Palmer and Dr. Helen Kingston, probably well known to many many of you. We invited each of them. To to give a response to the lecture and then we'll move into a more general uh, dialogue let's have a dialogue rather than just a Q&A let's have a conversation about what you've uh, learned and what has arisen for you uh, from Robin's lecture and um, we should be finished by uh, nine o'clock and you'll be really welcome to stay afterwards and have a glass of wine and uh, a chat with, uh, with with each other about about uh, what the the meaning of kindness in Froome is going to be in the future. That's a sort of a background uh, question lurking in all our minds, I think. So um, now let me get things underway um, by introducing uh, uh, Robin. Um, it seems very odd to have you sort of standing behind me, but uh, so I, I'm, I'm not I'm, I'm not basically I'm speaking. So. <laughs> But, uh, so, um, uh, uh, Robin is head of the School of Psychology at the University of Sussex. Now, uh, the Falmer, where the university is based, must be a, a very special place for you, Robin, because you spent a huge part of your life there. You were an undergraduate, you did the master's, you did a PhD, you then became a lecturer, you then became professor, and you're now head of the School of, of Psychology. So, like an arrow, <laughs> you have shot through the, uh, the structure of the, um, uh, the University of Sussex. I I have to um, say, can you all hear me all right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. I, I've got I've got a different I've got a different perspective on you because I think all right. <laughs> you, you you will see you will see when you look up to your left, that's my angle on you. There's a camera, I think, in the top left of the room. Is that right, Simon? <laughs> okay. Sorry, second. Left, so whether we can organize a slightly better view of the room. Don't think no, it's absolutely, it's absolutely fine. No, we, I can, we can't do much about it. I am exactly sorry, sorry about sorry, Robin. You'll have to uh, put up with us, but anyway, look, I'm, I'm sure you'll be telling us more about about your 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 um your history in this issue. Um, your doctoral studies were on the topic of social, cognitive, motivational, and emotional aspects of self preservation in uh, sorry self presentation in childhood. Um, but amongst um, many of your achievements, uh, you founded the Sussex Centre for Research in Kindness, um, which brings together an interdisciplinary team of academics diverse community partners uh, and others to explore, investigate and illuminate kindness and its impact on people and communities. And the, uh, as I understand it, there are two main themes to the center's work. First is research intending to understand the nature and impact of kindness. And then secondly, research on specific kindness interventions uh, designed to promote well well-being. Um, and Robin personally supervises a project on kindness and well-being in adolescence. I think that's, and, and obviously that's something that connects with your own history. Um, uh, and the idea behind that is to evaluate how and to what extent being kind is associated with well-being in adolescence and whether fostering kindness can serve to enhance well-being in this age group. Um, in 2021, you led a high-profile project, uh, just about as high-profile as an academic could wish, uh, with the BBC, the Kindness Test, which turned out to be the world's largest in-depth study of kindness. Um, and I think the figure I've got is something like 60,000 people contributed data to this, didn't they? So it's a remarkable study. Uh, you can see the results on the BBC's website, and you can hear more about this, in fact, uh, on Friday in this very room, when Claudia Hammond, uh, the Radio 4 presenter, psychologist, who I think has a role at Sussex, doesn't she? Yes. Yes, she does. She's, a visit she's our visiting professor for the public understanding of psychology. 
Right, right. Okay, so she'll be here in this very room on Friday uh, for, for afternoon tea. So do come along and join her and talk about uh, 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 her, her part in the um, kindness test. So um, I've left out whole swathes of your career, Robin, if there's anything that you're dying to tell us. But otherwise, let me, let me just ask you a few questions just to get us in, in the mood. Um, I've asked people here to think about how they would define kindness. Um, would you like to have a go at defining kindness for us? Well, you know, this is a, it's an interesting question, which is both simple and complicated at the same time. The simple answer, of course, is that an act of kindness is a, a, an act that's intended to benefit others. Um, and that's a very simple, straightforward, intuitive understanding that we all have, I think, and we all know what it's like to be on the receiving end of it. It feels great when someone is doing something to help us. Um, but the complexity that's in that definition is all around the motivation. I'll be speaking about that a little bit later. Um, that intention to do something for the benefit of others is a really important one. And what does it mean when we say there's an intention to be uh, caring towards others, to uh, look out for the welfare of others? Um, and how does that intention change from one situation to, other, uh, to another? How does it develop over the course of a lifespan? That's when you get the complexity in there. And can you also be kind to yourself as well? What does that look like? So there's a simple, simple answer, which is the intuitive one that I think we're all familiar with, but there's also some complexity about the underpinning psychology of it. Thank you. Can I just check, how are we doing on the hearing? Does everyone hear this all right? Everyone, okay. Is it possible to get a little bit louder? Just slightly louder, yes, okay. Thank you. Okay, this, the second question is slightly more personal. What was it that drew you to researching kindness? Well, it's interesting. My, my research has focused on the development of children and young people and really understanding social and emotional aspects of development through the lifespan, uh, from early years right through into adolescence and on beyond that into adulthood as well. So I've always had an interest in the social and emotional dynamics of children, teenagers and young adults' lives. Um, that then took me into the territory of understanding school life and I've spent a large part of my career focusing on the development of children and young people at school and I paid particular attention to the relationships that children and young people develop at school and that led me into the territory of kindness because so much of the focus in research in the time that I was doing this work was very much based around um, social and what's I'll talk about it a little bit later, what, what's called social and emotional learning, how children develop the social and emotional skills and competencies that are needed as they navigate the social world. And kindness is a really important part of our relational skills. It's really important glue that connects us with each other. And children have to navigate that what does it mean to be kind? What are the barriers to kindness? What are the things that make it difficult to be kind in a situation? They have to navigate that as they get older. But what I realized was that this isn't a simple matter of a teacher standing up in front of a class and saying, right, I'm gonna show you all what it means to be kind or teach you all about kindness today. It's something that grows as part of a community. And when I started to look at that concept of having a kind school, I realize, of course, that this isn't just about children learning skills. It's about everyone in the whole school community. It's about the staff as much as it is about the children. It's about the visitors coming into the school environment. It's about the way in which the school links with the rest of the community and the neighborhood. It's about all of us together. And once I started on that journey about what does it mean to have a kind school, I realized that there were so many other people across the academy in, in, in academia who were interested in looking at their particular discipline through the lens of kindness as well. Whether it was people in the business school thinking about business workplaces or people in politics or people in healthcare or people in social work. So I've worked with people across the whole um, uh, academic spectrum and one thing that has come through again and again, people are interested in looking at whatever their field of expertise is through the lens of kindness. And that's where the Sussex Center for Research on Kindness was born, out of that general interdisciplinary interest in kindness as an important part of our lives. Thank you, thank you. Last question. 
Um, I'm just wondering whether researching kindness has had any impact or effect on you personally. Well, you know, you talked about the BBC kindness test and you mentioned we had 60, over 60,000 people completing that questionnaire, which I always say was an act of kindness in itself. It really was because people gave up a considerable amount of time. This was not, I, can, I, can I have a quick show of hands? Did anyone in this room do the kindness test? Oh, we've got a, quite a few hands there. Fantastic. So it did get about, you see, the, the kindness test was completed by people from all over the country and indeed all over the world. We have people from well over 100 countries completing the kindness test. It was quite amazing. And people gave their time to do this. And one of the lovely things about it was that people drew attention to kindness in their lives. One of the big things that came out of the BBC kindness test results was that kindness is all around us. We just don't spend much time thinking about it, talking about it, shedding light on it, celebrating it. And of course, that's what was so pleasing. When I was going through the uh, results of the kindness test, we asked questions about the kindness that they experienced in their lives. And people were so brilliant about talking about acts that were small, and things that were really big that made a difference in their lives, experiences of kindness. And uh, when I go through the data set, you know, asking about the personal impact of doing research in this area, it's like, it's like when I'm looking at the data set, it's like scrolling through 60,000 little moments of kindness. And it's incredibly life affirming. It really is. And I think what you're all doing with the Froome Kindness Festival should similarly be life affirming for every one of you as well. The fact that you have made time for kindness in the community, you said, actually, this deserves attention. That means an awful lot. So I really hope that this is gonna be the beginning of a very, very positive week for you as you begin to notice all the kindness that's around us. Thank you very much. This is quite enough from me. Robin, we have a, a packed town hall of 50 people here waiting to hear your lecture, on the, uh, which is entitled Kindness in Context, Psychological Implications for Relationships and Wellbeing. We very much look forward to it. Over to you. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Well, as I said, thank you. I feel very, very honoured to be uh, opening this uh, series of kindness lectures. I hope that it does become a, a annual event. And it's great that I'm also opening uh, the events of the Froome Kindness Festival over the, over the coming week. Uh, as I said, I think it's just great that you're taking the time to draw attention to kindness. And goodness knows there is so much challenge in the world, so much adversity, so much horror in the world around us that that becomes all consuming. And you can understand why when you turn on the news or read a newspaper anywhere, we see all the tales of horror from around the world. And that's quite right. Of course, it should take our attention. But I think we neglect kindness at our own peril. I really think that kindness means something very important because it's the glue that holds us together. And I always say that actually by doing this, by coming together and talking about kindness and showing why it's important for all of us, it actually brings us closer together and gives us the platform for tackling some of those big, horrible global challenges. Coming together to do that as one community is so important and kindness might just be that key ingredient that enables us to unite around key um, challenges going forward. Now, I'm gonna try another technological um, uh, step here. Let's see whether this works. Well, I did try it out with Susie just before. So can you see that uh, window now, which has a, you should see a full screen. Does that work? Everybody can see, can I have a thumbs up from people? Okay, that works. Okay, fantastic. So, and, and this, by the way, of course, is Brighton Beach, where I do all of my research. Now, I'm not actually sat on the beach all the time, um, but we are actually very close to Brighton Beach, and it is absolutely beautiful there. So we're waiting for the summer to arrive. Uh, okay, so I'm going to be talking about s s kindness in context. And that phrase, kindness in context, really matters because I want to put kindness in a social context, and I particularly want to put it in a socio-relational context. 
I want to make it clear, make it clear right at the outset that kindness needs to be understood in the context of our relationships with each other. It's not just something that's inside us as sort of individuals. We're not sat in a vacuum. We're all people, social creatures interacting with each other, and we need to look at kindness in that context. As, um, as Simon said very kindly, we have put together, I think, a really great Sussex Center for Research on Kindness. Um, and I will be sharing, Simon and Susie, I'll send a link to you. I will be sharing the link to yet another event, and there are more and more events about kindness going on. I will share another event on kindness, uh, which is taking place in, 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 in Brighton at, at our university uh, at the end of this month as well. And you'd be very welcome to join. You can be on the other end, right? You're in person now, but uh, at this other event, you could join online. So I'll, I'll, I'll share that. We're trying to do lots and lots together to bring people together around the theme of kindness. Now, where am I coming from? Well, I'm a psychologist. And a big focus for me throughout my whole career has been mental health and well-being, particularly through the lifespan. I've done a lot of work looking at early development um, of children and young people, thinking about the social and emotional dimensions in particular. And it might sound obvious to you that when we're looking at mental health and well-being, we need to be looking at social relationships. And that's absolutely correct. We do need to do that. We really need to pay attention to mental health and well-being in the context of our social relationships. And actually, as you'll see in a moment, that's where kindness comes in. However, I also want to draw your attention to what often happens in practice. When you're thinking about mental health and well-being, it's amazingly easy to fall into a trap of individualizing it. What I mean by that is you start to describe mental health and well-being as if they're a sort of dispositional quality of the person. So that the task of providing mental health support in schools or in a workplace or in any community setting becomes who are those people who've got mental health problems and what are we going to do about them? How can we fix those individuals who've got mental health problems? You see what I did there? happens all the time. We think about mental health as if it's a property of the individual. And I always say that is barking up the wrong tree because mental health and well-being need to be understood within a relational ecology. We need to understand the network of relationships within which the individual is embedded if we want to understand their mental health and well-being because people matter to us, our relationships matter to us. And that's very important because then the task is not simply which kids or which adults, which individuals have mental health problems and what are we gonna do to fix that child? What are we gonna do to fix that person? You know what? Sometimes the answer is not fix the person, is not to fix the child. The answer very often is fix the environment fix the context. And that's why I've said right at the beginning that when I talk about kindness, I want to put kindness in context. We need to understand what the context is like, whether that's within the family, within the peer group, within the school community, within the, com within the wider community, within Froome, right? You're, you're all there in Froome Town Hall. What's the kindness experience like in the community. That's what we need to be thinking about. Now, one other very important point. Can you see those uh, boxes that I've just put on the bottom of the screen, where it says motivation and engagement and achievement outcomes, productivity, performance, things like that. One of my missions is to try and show that the things that are on the top of the screen, the mental health and the well-being and the social relationships, are intimately connected with the things on the bottom of the screen. And in a school context, this matters hugely. We need to understand what's going on in the school context at a social and emotional level, but that is not a separate task from understanding what's happening in terms of children's academic engagement and their performance outcomes and how they do in tests and exams, right? Because one of the ironic things is that when people start talking about mental health and well-being and social relationships, 
they put it onto the periphery. They say, well, that's not the central focus. Oh, yes, we need to do that thing as well. We need to, I think people now do have a, a sense that actually we've got an issue. We need to do something about, again, those children who've got mental health difficulties. But it's somehow seen as quite other, quite separate from the core business of the school, which is meant to be about engaging with the academic curriculum, doing well on tests, performing well on exams and things like that. And yet, of course, the school, the learning experience, workplaces, all of these places are fundamentally social places where our relationships matter. And what research shows again and again and again is that if you don't get the stuff on the top of the screen right, the stuff on the bottom of the screen becomes compromised. It's not to say that someone who's having difficulties with their mental health or well-being or relationships can't achieve successfully and can't perform brilliantly. That does happen. But the general pattern is that the relational context really matters for how we get on in life. And that's what we need to be paying attention to. And I do this kind of work all the time. I try to map out what's going on in a person's social life. This is a sociogram. I don't know if you've ever seen anything like this before. This is not something that I've invented. This is something that's been around for a very, very long time in, um, uh, in education circles um, for many, many decades, actually. Uh, early in the 20th century already, people were doing this kind of work. It's a visual representation of the network of relationships that exists within any social group. So this is, this is actually real data. The names are made up. But this is real data. This is a year five class, nine to 10 years old. Okay. And the, the, the arrows here are all indicating who says that they most like to play with whom. That's the simple question. Who do you most like to hang out with? Who do you most like to play with? And can you see the distribution of the arrows is very different, right? Because this is a real social group. Look at Nadia on the right with the green circle. She has loads of arrows pointing to her. Loads of kids want to hang out with her. They say, I want to play most of all with Nadia. But then look at the uh, circle at the very top in the middle, Rio. Rio says, I most like to hang out with Nathan and Chris and Joseph. And not one single boy nominates him back. Not one single one of them. In fact, we know that there isn't a single person in the class who's nominated Rio back as someone that they most like to play with. Now, I won't go into the detail about the labels that are used and so on. These are very old kind of traditional um, ap approaches that are used in what's called sociometry. sociometry. That's the name of this kind of field of work. But I wanted to draw your attention to the fact that this is the reality at any given point in any given social group people's relationships are going on all the time. And, you know, I'll, I'll give you an example. When I was doing work on this in a school, uh, gosh, must be about 20 years ago now, I, I remember um, speaking with this teacher about this work, which was under the umbrella of sort of emotional literacy. And the, the teacher is a busy, busy secondary school. And he said, he said, Robin, he said, I respect what you're doing. He said, I know it's important. I, I, I like what you're doing. I, I can see that it's, it's, it's important. But he said, I just don't have time for all this feeling stuff, he said. I just don't have time for all this feeling stuff because I've got a very, very packed history syllabus to get through. Now, of course, he was also saying almost in the same breath that he was having to spend over 50% of his time just trying to control his class. So I think there's something to be done there, right? My point was that it doesn't matter whether you say you've got time for it or not. It doesn't matter whether you say, I'm going to spend time talking about mental health or kindness or relationships or well-being. It doesn't matter whether you say you're going to focus on it or not. It's going to be there because you're dealing with human beings. It's there in every interaction, in every group, in every context in every school classroom, in every workplace, in every community setting. Of course it's there because we're people. And, you know, let me just say as well, I, I, I could spend a whole evening talking about these kinds of patterns in children. I'm not going to spend uh, very much more talking about it. Um, but I will say 
sometimes people ask, well, you know what kids are like, they're friends one minute and then they, you know, something happens and they fall out with each other and then they, they make up and they're best friends by the end of the day, all in one day. And that's true. There is a huge amount of volatility in children's relationships. However, however, some patterns become entrenched. Sometimes negative patterns become entrenched and we have to try and learn from that. What's going on that leads to patterns becoming entrenched and what can we do about it? And this is a kind of thing that I do. So this is an illustration. I do a lot of, although uh, um, Simon, you said that I've been at Sussex, it feels like forever since an undergraduate. I have to say that's very true. I've been in Brighton for over 30 years now, but before that I had an extremely well, volatile isn't the right word. I had, I had a lot of international travel in my life. I didn't grow up in this country. Um, so I traveled a lot. Um, and the international agenda is very important to me because I had a very international upbringing in different countries. And uh, connecting with people from around the world is very important because you realize that actually the perspectives that we have with the people around us aren't the same as what people have from different places when they've had often quite different experiences. So understanding the commonalities and the differences across countries is, is important. And this is an example, I tried to do this in my research, uh, working with people from different countries. So this is a, a study that we actually ran in Italy. Um, I have a, a group of collaborators that I work with very regularly in uh, Northern Italy, just outside Milan. And we were tracking children through the first few years of their school lives. And we were showing that some children were more tuned in to the social world than others, more adept at understanding what people were thinking and feeling, or more, if you like, more in tune with the different perspectives that people have on the world already at the age of five or six years old. And I'll, I'll let you think about why that might be. How do you end up with those differences already at such a young age? But what I wanted to draw your attention to was how that ability to connect empathically with others, to have that more sophisticated understanding of the social world is related to kind behavior, this pro-social behavior. When we found that you could track the link between social understanding and the pro-social behavior, we were able to follow it up. This was a, uh, this was a longitudinal study where we followed children over three years and we showed from five to six to seven years old you could predict where they end up on that diagram that I was showing you before right how do they end up in terms of their peer relationships how do they end up getting on with others in the class or indeed falling out with them so where does kindness fit in with all of this well I said before the complexity of kindness lies around the fact that it's not just the behavior it's not just what you do is what comes underneath it. And you can see here, as people have talked about kindness in ways that draw attention to the motivation, you can see uh, Eisenberg talking about not motivated by external factors such as rewards or punishment. Peterson and Seligman talking about being compassionate and concerned about others' welfare. And fundamentally, that last quote shows it all, doesn't it? Involves both the pro-social acts and the underlying motivations. And it's very important for us to think about what that means, because actually that makes a difference to how we are feeling in the situation. And kindness has, for sure, an emotional context. Um, you mentioned, uh, Simon, very kindly, the work that we've been doing with adolescents. And I love this study. This was a study that one of my PhD students, Jess Cotney, brilliant PhD student, what she did with me. And her very first study focused on just talking with teenagers about kindness. What does it look like? What does it mean? Where do you see it? Where don't you see it? And so on. And the focus groups with adolescents, I, I have to say, you know, when I started off on this topic, I, I was a bit skeptical. I've been doing lots of work on mental health in schools, lots of work on well-being with teenagers, and I was a bit skeptical. What would teenagers say about kindness? I mean, too, as you were saying, Simon, right? Maybe people would say, oh, it's too soft, it's too fluffy. And I was worried that teenagers would, would dismiss it and wouldn't pay attention to it. And I have to say, Jess did an amazing piece of work because the teenagers were so responsive. They actually responded to it better than some of the other work that we'd been doing with them because it meant something to them. 
there was an immediate connection. We know what it means. Oh, sorry, I just pressed up my mistake. We know what it means when someone's kind. We know what it feels like. And for sure, we know what it feels like when someone's unkind. And they talked about it in quite a sophisticated way. No, they did. They didn't. These were like twelve and fourteen-year-olds, right? They weren't talking just about helping someone or giving something to someone. They were talking about forgiveness. They were talking about honesty. They were talking about sometimes things being quite tough and kindness sometimes being quite tough. Sometimes you have to give a tough message to someone to be honest with them, but it's the kindest thing to do. And it was really striking for me just how sophisticated and nuanced these young young people were talking about kindness and they were experiencing that. They were thinking about forgiveness and honesty and thinking about what that means and how that makes people feel. And <clears throat> that fundamental point at the bottom, that kindness is not just about feeling good because you've received it. It's also about the impact from giving it. And this is really what we went on to try and scale up in this big study that you talked about, um, Simon. So you'll see the wonderful Claudia later this week. I'm so glad that you're gonna have a chance to meet with her in person. Uh, Claudia's done an absolutely wonderful job of showcasing the work on kindness and taking it to a new level. You know, when, when we started this project, it wasn't clear how people were gonna respond, but it was just like what I said with the teenagers at school when we were starting that project with the adolescents we've had the best response we could have hoped for in terms of the engagement with really what was quite a long questionnaire. It took about half an hour for people to complete. So it really was an act of kindness. And over 60,000 people shared their ideas. And you will hear a lot, I'm sure, from Claudia when you see her about the things that she learned, that we all learned from the study of kindness. There are articles from her online. And I should say as well, if you haven't had a chance to uh, look at this book, please do. It's a beautiful book by Claudia, uh, which talks a lot about our work together um, and the whole, lit the whole sort of academic research literature on the topic. Now, I'm not gonna try and do an exhaustive uh, summary of all the different things that came out of the, the BBC project, because actually we're still doing the analysis. It's a huge one. We've got millions of data points and we're still trawling through all of that at the moment. But I wanted to just take out a few things and then we can move over to kind of questions from the panel and uh, this from, from, well, from all of you as well. A few things about what kindness looks like in our lives. One of the things that was interesting was how you see real differences across different parts of our lives. Um, we asked people how much kindness is valued in different places. And you can see, as you would hope, where they are at home, this is on a scale from one to seven. When they're at home, we had the highest score in terms of kindness being valued, 5.84. Healthcare settings was next, medical settings next, places of worship. Workplaces, I was really delighted to see. You know, that was like the fourth highest. And you can see some things were a little bit on the lower side. Unfortunately, bottom of the pile, um, in terms of people's perceptions, was politics. People's perceptions of politics was particularly that kindness was not valued there. I don't necessarily think that's the experience for everyone involved in politics. We're working with a very, very interesting group called Compassion in Politics, which is focused on actually finding and showcasing the role of compassion in politics. And there is such a role. It's a really important one for us to look at. But nonetheless, there is something about the way in which that appears in public discourse, which creates all sorts of problems and maybe has knock on effects as well. So, I mean, this is across the entire sample of, you know, many tens of thousands of people. I'd be very curious to know where you think Froome is in terms of a community of kindness. How much is kindness valued in different parts of Froome? And how does it vary from one place to another? One thing I was really interested in was that bit about kindness being valued at work, because when we asked people about their own workplace, we asked people who are employed currently, we asked people, what is it like in your workplace at the moment? Is kindness valued? <clears throat> and the answer was, yes, it is. 
it is valid. People gave an, um, an average score of 3.9 on a scale from one to five, so well above the midpoint on the scale. But again, differences between different fields of work. Look at this. These were the top four, social work, healthcare, hospitality industry, and education. I was interested in this. I don't necessarily think this means that in these fields of work, kindness is easier or that it's all around necessarily, but this was people's perceptions of how much kindness is valued, the difference that it makes in those environments. And you know, one of the questions for me is, we did have some fields of work where uh, kindness was perceived as not so valued. Now, actually, it didn't matter what field of work you were looking at, the schools tended to be above the midpoint on the scale. So that's a really important point. This is not like there was any field of work where people were actively saying kindness is not at all valued. They generally did say that kindness was valued, but they were a bit more neutral in comparison with these fields. Things like finance and insurance, things like people working in the utilities, energy industry. And I was really interested in that. Obviously, you can see social work, hospitality, education, healthcare are sort of people facing industries, aren't they? But it occurred to me, of course, that it doesn't matter what field of work you're in, they're all people oriented work fields. Or at least they're all potentially human oriented fields of work. And one of the big things that I'm trying to think about now is how you can work with any organizational context, even one that might traditionally be seen as not very people focused. Maybe it's a much more money focused industry and say, actually, people are here. People are connecting with each other or not. And we need to think about how we can foster those positive connections. Now, this cannot be a simple matter of someone standing up like a boss or a leader in an organization, standing up in front of everybody and say, right, you lot, you've all got to be kind now. Go and be nice to each other. Right. It doesn't work like that. It's about transforming the cultural context of the community. We've done a lot of this work in schools. We've done a lot of work focused on helping young people to develop the social and emotional skills and competencies that they need to navigate the social world, like I was saying before. But this doesn't work by a teacher just coming up and saying, right, I'm going to teach you a lot how to, um, I don't know, resolve conflicts peacefully. Um, I'm going to teach you uh, what to do when someone's being horrible to you. Well, that might be part of what happens. Maybe that happens in a I don't know, in a circle time, or it might happen in a PSHE class, personal social and health education class. There might be lessons where teachers can provide that kind of support to children and young people. But it's also about weaving the focus on relationships, the focus on social connection into the fabric of the whole school community. It's about how the staff are interacting with each other. You don't even need to be focusing on just how the staff are with the children. How are the staff with each other? How are the people getting on in this environment? And everyone is part of this community. So let's think about everybody. And what we did in this, I won't go into detail, but what we did in this particular study from some years ago now, was we looked at the extent to which the work on social and emotional uh, learning in school was being woven into the fabric of the whole school community. And when it was, what we found was that both the staff and the children talked about experiencing a more positive social and emotional ethos at the school, much more positive uh, sort of school climate, right? And this was done using thousands of data points uh, with uh, anonymous surveys. So it's really interesting to see that that does seem to be uh, a, a core function of how much attention is being placed on social and emotional dimensions across the whole school community. Now that of course predicted young people's social experiences. Obviously, if you're in a more positive social and emotional school climate, you're hopefully gonna be experiencing a lot more inclusion, a lot more support from your friends, things like that. But look at these two points as well. 
we also found that those schools had a higher level of attainment. And this was on the headline core kind of exam performance results, the key stage two SATs for primary schools and GCSE results for the 16 year olds. And we also found lower levels of persistent absence. So this tells you something that the social and emotional qualities of life at school, which affects everybody, not just a sort of a, a sort of a small group of children who are deemed to have problems. This is about everybody, the universal approach, that those things are connected in a very fundamental way with how we succeed. And I mean succeed in the broadest sense of the word, in our relationships, in how we get on with each other, in how we learn, how we perform. And that's something that we really need to be focusing on. And it's an ongoing challenge. I do, I'm doing a lot of work at the moment on um, something you may have come across, um, the uh, development of these new mental health support teams. This is really an innovation over the last few years where uh, teams of um, uh, clinicians, we do a lot of the training actually for, for clinicians at, at Sussex, um, teams of clinicians working in the NHS are actually embedded in school environments and they're working to provide support to children and young people before problems escalate into kind of a significant acute sort of referrals to um, major mental health services. This is about getting in there early and making sure we're doing things right. Now, one aspect of that is what we call this whole school approach. And it's one of the things that we're trying to do to try and get an approach which isn't just about which kids have problems, what are we going to do with them? And it's more about what are we doing with all of us, not them, it's all of us together, all the staff, all the families, our connections with the community, and yes, all the children and young people as well. Further afield, slightly further afield in Wales, I'm doing a big piece of work there with the Welsh government focused on the curriculum. Now, Wales doesn't follow the same curriculum, a national curriculum as in England. And uh, just this year, we've begun the, actually it was September 22, we've begun the rollout of curriculum for Wales, national rollout. And it's something we've been working on for five years. I've been very, very pleased to be part of the process with Welsh government, working with lots and lots of um, uh, educational practitioners from up and down the country. But I wanna show you this really important step. And it's not an easy one. And you know, we've only really just begun the rollout, but look what's right there in the top row. Health and well-being is one of the six areas of learning and experience, along with humanities, languages, math, science, technology, etc. Health and well-being is right there, same level, same sense of being a core part of what it means to be at school. And I think that's such an important step. And there's a lot of work to be done in that area, but this is signifying that our attention to kindness, our attention to empathy, our attention to compassion, our focus on relationships, our commitment to supporting health and well-being is not just a peripheral extra for a small minority of people who've got problems. It's about transforming the environment for all of us. So I'm gonna leave it there. I, I hope that's given you some sort of insights and ideas about things that we've been doing I think that what you're doing as a community to come together in Froome to draw attention to kindness and to say, this isn't just about an optional extra. It's not just a luxury if you've got time. It's not just a soft, fluffy thing that doesn't really count for the core business of what me makes a difference in people's lives. This is the core thing that makes a difference in people's lives. Of course, there's other things as well, but kindness is right at the heart of being a person. It's right at the heart of having a relationship with each other. And those relationships are what enable us to achieve our potential, to realize our ambitions, right? These are the things which enable us to tackle the biggest challenges of our time. 
So I hope this has been helpful for you. I'm really looking forward to hearing your insights because this is as much about you as it is about me telling you. So if it's about you exploring things together, but I'll stop there and say, thank you so much for your attention. Thank you for inviting me today. Oh, that's lovely. Well, wow, Robin, that was wonderful. Thank you so much for giving us so much to think about and uh, such an a, a inspiring manner in which you speak as well. You clearly oh. really enjoy this subject and uh, you're passionate about it. And so thank you. And thank you for constantly reminding us we need to think what these things mean in Froome. So um, to give an immediate response to uh, whatever aspect of what you've said interests them, Bill Palmer, um, who is a physical therapist who's worked with uh, young people who have a very particular approach, which you might say something about if, if we have a moment, and Dr. Helen King Kingston, I don't know if, if you are aware of her, Robin, but she is not only the lead uh, uh, GP at Froome Medical Practice, but also the co-founder of the Compassionate Froome project, which, which actually embodies a number of the things that you've been talking about, the huge importance of social connection, uh, particularly for people suffering loneliness and isolation, with some extraordinary clinical results, I think, uh, to demonstrate the effectiveness of that. So, um, uh, Helen, would you like to go first? And um, you, you need to use the microphone. Thank you. Uh, please. That's it. So thank you. Really interesting to hear you talk um, and great um, for you to join us. I think that did really chime very much with me, that, that sense of being alongside people and relationships are so important to everybody's well-being. Um, and that sense of connecting with one another, which is so much part of kindness. So really good to hear you say that. And I think our challenge here is how do we magnify those individual acts of kindness? How do we work together as a community to make sure that that connection is touching all of us? I think that's really a, the, the key question for us now is how do we grow it, right? Um, I, what, one of the really interesting things that came out of the BBC kindness test was what was people, how did people perceive the impact of COVID on kindness? And uh, what came out quite strongly, especially in the UK, it wasn't the case in all parts of the world, by the way, it was particularly in the UK, um, was that uh, people felt kindness had uh, increased as a result of COVID, that COVID had made people kinder. It wasn't the, it wasn't the universal perception, but overall it was something like 70% of people felt that COVID had made people kinder. And one of the questions I often get asked is, how do we make sure that that actually is people's experience and continues to be people's experience? And I always say, no one is gonna do it for us. It's up to us, we have to do it which is why coming together like this is so important. If something happened during COVID that enabled us to connect with each other and come together to support each other through this kind of shared challenge in society, we have to figure out how we hold on to those social connections. And I don't have the answers, but I think that what you're doing right now is part of it. Yes, uh, thank you, Robin. That was really interesting. And I'm particularly interested in uh, your work in, with young people and with schools. As um, for a couple of decades, I worked with children with physical disabilities. And what I'm interested in, interested to hear from you really is, um, one insight that I got from that work was that people were very kind to these children in many ways they were doing things but in another way they weren't being kind because they were in some way pressuring them to be normal and <clears throat> um, we developed a, a style of work where instead of um, trying to help children to be as normal as possible we focused on valuing what their abilities were rather than their disabilities, even if they were very weird. And, um, um, and what we found was that that valuing of difference was one of the main things of, of helping someone to feel integrated. 
I just wanted to hear your feedback on that, really. Thank you very much. It's a really interesting one because trying to get everybody to fit into the same mold feels like it's going to be fraught with risks. Um, and that sense of people not really feeling respected, not feeling valued, when you do that, I think is a very, very real concern. And we know that there are massive issues with people just feeling like, I don't belong, that I'm not part of this group. I don't belong in this place. And so I think what you say about a new style of work, which kind of abandons the idea of just who is normal, who is not normal. You know, these are really, these can become very, very challenging words. And, you know, I think people are much more aware of the kinds of risks of this uh, now than they perhaps used to be. I think what we're beginning to realize is that we need to value all the diversity that there is in the world because that diversity is the richness of human experience and we can learn from each other especially when there is difference especially when perspectives are different we can learn and one of the great challenges of course which i think you're all familiar with is that so often if we try to bring other people to our perspective we sometimes unwittingly and unintentionally end up feeling like we're right, you're wrong, I'm not interested in what you're saying, you don't belong here, you're not one of us. And that's a very, very difficult situation for us because we're dealing with really complex things. So I think a starting point has to be to recognize that people are coming into the world and will have experiences in the world where there are differences. And that's a very important recognition that the differences matter and that we learn more and become stronger together when we appreciate those differences, when we recognize that, you know what, the way I see the world is different from the way you see the world and that's okay. We need to actually come together with a sense of care and compassion. That's the key thing. It's actually care and compassion and kindness and empathy that unites us, even in the context of difference. And to me, that's a really important sort of uh, awareness that we need to grow. Yeah, I really agree. I mean, but w one thing that makes me almost despair is that um, the normative pressures are uh, there right from the beginning of schooling and it's almost built into the school system that uh, valuing someone's differences is um, it's uh, you know we're, the school system is aimed really at um, getting people to be normal or uh, achieving various targets and rather than um, nurturing their differences their individual individuality well, you know what, I think you're, you're, you're right to raise that challenge because I think there's so much where you feel like the system is kind of against this notion of embracing richness, embracing that diversity. But I feel like there is a way forward with this. And I've, I've done this, I've seen it happen, and I've done it myself in schools. And that is to <clears throat> bring to conscious awareness, make explicit what's often implicit, the concept of success. What does success actually mean? And it's a very interesting one because I think we need to ask ourselves that as well. Like if I was to ask every one of you, tell me about a person who's really successful, who's a successful person in life. Quite often you end up talking about people who are kind of in the limelight, people who are quite dominant or prominent socially, celebrities who have maybe a lot of money, or who have the right looks, who have the right image. And certainly when you talk about what does success look like from the point of view of um, a, a child growing up, I mean, they're surrounded by images of celebrities, whether that's in the sports or in the entertainment industry, whatever it might be. Image, wealth, fame, those kinds of things are really prominent. Where is kindness in that? Where's mental health and well-being in that? So sometimes 
we can ask ourselves that question, what does success actually mean? What are we all trying to achieve here, right? If from a point of view of a school, maybe the school leader is thinking, what's gonna happen in relation to my exam results? And so maybe exam results become a key index of success. And I think one of the interesting things we need to do is to ha have that absolutely surfaced. So we talk about what does success mean? What does success mean in Froome? Is it having a lot of money? Is it being socially dominant or prominent, right? I, I'll give you a, a, a specific example. You know, I showed you that uh, sociogram. The, you remember the diagram I was showing you with, uh, um, with the arrows connecting the children when we asked them, who do you most like to play with or who do you most like to hang out with? You know, something interesting. When you ask children a slightly different question, Instead of who do you most like to hang out with, who do you think is most popular in the classroom? You get a very interesting pattern of results. You would think that it's more or less asking the same question because surely the children who have the most, most like nominations, like you saw Nadia, all the people who say they're most like to hang out with her, would also be the people who children overall regard as the most popular in the class. But actually, the overlap is quite modest. Very often people choose different kids as the ones who are most popular than the ones who are genuinely most liked within the class. And the people who are perceived to be most popular, I think chime with our conception of success. Very often when people are asked who is the most popular in the class. And to be honest, we've seen this. This is also true when we ask teachers and parents as well. They choose different children, not the ones who are genuinely most liked very often. They'll choose the children who are always in the limelight, who are very dominant, very socially prominent. And you know what? Sometimes those children are actually creating lots of difficulties for other children. Sometimes they can be bullies who are creating a lot of aggressive interactions in the classroom. And yes, they are socially prominent. Yes, they do seem to have lots of other kids around them all the time, but they're actually creating a lot of negativity in the class. And I think that's such an interesting thing because when you do this work, you realize that actually, even within a group of nine to 10 year old children, there are different ideas about what success means. What does success look like? And I guess that's the question for you. What does success look like? Can you redefine what success means in Froome? What are we motivated to achieve? I, I think those are the kinds of conversations we need to start to have. I think, you know, my reflection on that is actually it's probably, you know, self-acceptance and a sense of belonging, which are the things that we need to aim for but they're not, um, they're not the parameters by which um, government and um, various other authorities that measure us on the mathematics will necessarily measure us. So it's very easy in this computer world to want a percentage and a figure and a number for this, that and the other. But it's actually that ability to feel that we belong, that we're accepted um, and to enable that for everybody that really matters, isn't it? 100%, 100%. I mean, I, I couldn't agree more. And actually, all the psychological research shows that, that the key things that we need to be valuing in relation to our intrinsic motivation, in relation to our ability to flourish as human beings, are to do with exactly that self acceptance, and also a kind of a self actualization as well, that kind of achieving our potential, being able to feel fulfilled in our development, right? That's one point. And then belonging, feeling like you're part of the community, it kind of goes back to what you were saying before in relation to the disability, feeling that yes, there are differences, but I'm here, and I belong. That's a really important thing. And then the other ingredient that I'll add to your list, um, is uh, health. Health, I think, is really important, and we don't give enough attention to it. I know, you know, you've, hear, you've heard that phrase kind of uh, um, uh, about, you know, health being the key factor in all, all of our lives. Of course it is, but we tend not to focus on that, right? 
we put health to one side and we put mental health to one side because in a very strange way, we'll abandon what feels intuitively like the right thing, which is actually, I want to feel well. I want to feel like I'm physically healthy. I want to feel like I'm mentally healthy and I want to feel connected with people. I feel like I belong. You put all of that aside because of this dominant focus on image and wealth and fame and things like that. And I, I think that's one of the really interesting tensions. And you know, we just have to raise awareness of it and we have to remind ourselves of it because we are constantly bombarded with images of success, which are different. Okay, in a minute, I'm going to open up the floor to see what you're thinking. Um, share thoughts, questions, comments. Um, and just while you start to think about what it is you want to say, I'll just ask one more. Uh, and Helen, Bill, if you want to come into any stage, please do. Um, so, so Robin, I noticed one of the things that uh, uh, the one of your 10 key findings from the kindness test was that there was a link between extroversion and kindness. And I'm just wondering if uh, there is a link between personality and kindness in terms of the kinds of ways uh, kindness gets expressed or received according to different personality types? Well, it's interesting. Is it just a matter of perception? I'm not sure about that. I think there were modest links with personality. These were not very big effects, okay? Um, so yes, absolutely, there were links with personality. Personality does make a difference, but it makes a difference to the extent that you are creating the opportunities for experiencing it, for giving it, and for noticing it. So that's the point. And I don't want anybody to be coming away thinking that you've got to be a complete social butterfly in order to experience kindness in the world, because that's not true. It's about whatever the personality profile that a given person has, where are the opportunities to be kind, to receive kindness, and to see kindness around you? And everybody can do that, regardless of personality. It doesn't matter whether you're particularly extroverted or not. Yes, there will be patterns, of course, because you're going to be having more you know, an extroverted person is probably going to be having more opportunities for social interaction. But those opportunities are going to be there for everybody, regardless of personality. And I want to draw your attention, particularly to the point about noticing kindness. We found that being kind, well, of course, receiving kindness, that's of course is related to people feeling uh, happier and more well-being, right? Because you're receiving something really nice from other people. But being kind was uh, associated with well-being, but also seeing kindness, or I use a different word, noticing kindness was associated with higher levels of well-being. And everybody can do that. We can all spend a bit of time noticing the kindness that's in our lives. And one of the things people said in the BBC kindness test was that actually doing the questionnaire itself, I got a lot of letters from people afterwards. People uh, wrote to me at the university. A lot of people said actually doing the questionnaire itself was a bit of a kind of a, well, like I said before, a life affirming reminder of just how much kindness there is once you start to think about it. Once you start to think about it, we have to take that step to think about it. And that's what we're all doing right now. Thank you, thank you. Right, uh, we've got 50 people here who are all now thinking about kindness. What are you thinking? What questions, what observations have you got? Um, we need to use the microphone partly so Robin can hear and partly so only one person speaks at a time. So would anyone like to come in at this, at this point? Uh, Thank you, Robin. That was really, really interesting. And it's lovely to see. I have a friend in Wales who has just been telling me about the new curriculum that her children are, are starting to learn. So it's amazing to know that you're behind that. Um, sadly, I have uh, two years experience in Froome in the school system of um, a lot of unkindness to the point two weeks ago, I've had to remove my autistic child from the school system and home educate him all due to bullying. And just listening to all of this this evening, it's, it breaks my heart when I listen to him. Um, he actually said to me, mommy, I just want to go to sleep and not wake up a couple of weeks ago. And his main words were, I don't understand mommy. I'm so kind. Why, why are people being so horrible to me? 
and he just doesn't understand. And it's a, I'm realizing it is a full culture in not just that school, but many other schools. We've tried a few schools. He stands out a little bit. He's a bit bigger. He speaks adult communication. I have to ask Alexa what half of the words are that he talks to me about when he's gone to bed, you know, yeah. um, but he's kind. He's just a big, friendly giant, but it's misunderstood. And so then he's targeted. And I just, I think really, uh, you are so right about the awareness. And I now have this awareness, but I've spent two very tiring years saying, can we do something more about bullying? It's bullying policies, but now I'm on a personal mission and it's been great to listen to this, to actually start helping the schools realize that kindness needs to be embedded rather than looking at anti-bullying, actually just, reading kindness so but thank you this has been amazing oh thank you so much for sharing that and my goodness that's a that's a really painful story and I'm so sorry that you and your family have had to um, go through that over the past couple of years I know that's a really emotionally draining and exhausting process and very difficult for everyone concerned the I, I think the kind of journey that you've been on with though also has tremendous potential and I'd really invite you, encourage you to take that learning experience and drive it forward um, in that mission that you described. I think it's so important and I really want to encourage you to do that. Um, it's really interesting that you talked about this not, not being about just the kind of traditional anti-bullying work and I 100% agree with you because for a long time people thought about bullying very much in terms of well you've got the bully and then you've got the victim and what are you going to do about those two individuals and it comes back to what I said right at the beginning sometimes the answer is not fix the child sometimes the answer is fix the environment work with the context right that was the title of my talk kindness in context and sometimes the biggest step that we can take in an anti-bullying context is not actually about what are we going to do about the bully. It's what are we going to be doing about us, all of us in the school context. So I just want to, um, again, say thank you for sharing that. That must be really, really difficult. But I hope you can take that experience, recognize that actually kindness in your son is hugely important and is going to be massively important for him in terms of the relationships that he's developing, because actually that is a glue for our relationships. It makes a difference. That's giving the most secure platform for well-being that you could get. And what we need to do is find a way to make sure that message comes through loud and clear in every community setting, in every school. And you know, I'm, I'm on that mission with you, I guess, is what I wanna say. And I hopefully all of us can spread the word on that front. And hello. Yeah, um, my name is Christopher and um, I'm like maybe a few years behind you. I've got a son who's six and um, we've now had our third meeting with the head teacher. And um, my son is saying, um, I'm so sad. I don't want to live. So I would like to meet with you and anybody else in this community to not have a behavior policy in school, which there are some lots of things I could say about that. But how about if we had a kindness policy? And how about if we do it in a way that is restorative and generative? And that it is driven not just by, and with great respect, um, educational and um, psychologists speak, but we actually include the voices of other ways of thinking and looking at our life and our world. Because these young people that shine like yours does are some of the people that think even further and even deeper than the really great research that obviously you've been doing. And I have a particular question for you. Do you know of a woman called Kit Messenger? No, I haven't come. Tell me about that. I will message you and um, have a have a chat. Fantastic. I would love to love to know more about that. I mean, I, I, I agree with uh, what you're saying. Um, there is something really fundamental about how we 
transform the environment in different community settings, including schools, but it's not just, it's not limited to schools, it's about every community setting that we're working with, how we transform the environment to make it genuinely inclusive where everybody can feel like they, yes, they do belong. And they're not, you know, part of this, like I said before, not part of this kind of cookie cutter mold where everyone's exactly the same. And that that's actually not just okay. It's not just about tolerating it, right? This isn't about saying, okay, we're just going to tolerate these differences. It's actually about celebrating it, celebrating the rich diversity of human beings. So completely agree with you. And I do hope that you are able to get somewhere with your um, uh, with your son in the school environment. Yeah, thank you. And it's happening within business because I work within neurodiversity coaching within high level organizations so i know that with the right questions and the right way of looking at things the voices that have been not heard are starting to be heard and i don't want people to have to wait until the mid or the end of their career we need it now we need it now in the world oh well thank you very much i mean i should say uh we launched last year I think it was, uh, was it February last year? Something, I think it was just about a year ago, or maybe it was March, yeah. Just about a year ago, we launched our first ever, the world's first ever online course on the psychology of kindness and well-being at work, a full postgraduate certificate in that area. Um, study in your own pace, at your own time. Um, and it's been wonderful because it's grown, as these things often do, handful of people started it um, but within the first year we've already up to about 40 people taking the course now and they're from all walks of life work across different sectors we've got people working for multinational huge multi the big huge multinational uh, tech corporations right through to people in a modeling agency people in a vets practice people in uh, the NHS um, from all different sectors all coming together with that vision that you were just describing there about what can we do to make our workplaces, our communities, places where kindness is celebrated and valued, and in that way support everybody's ability to flourish. It's, it's a very different perspective because what you're doing is you're moving away from the idea that we're just trying to fix problems it's a much more strength-based approach to say, look at all of us, look at the wonder of all of us. What can we do with that to enable each one of us to flourish together? I think it's the, it's, it's the way we absolutely need to go. It, it does sound as though your research on the on sort of whole school approaches to social and emotional learning is something that could be a value in fruit. So let's, let's see what we can uh, do about that. Um, who else would like to come in? Um, what other um, groups? Just hello. Thank you, Robin. Just to introduce myself to those people that are talking. Uh, I work with the Good Heart and the Kindness Festival going into schools. Uh, we've been into eight of the 11 schools doing kindness uh, workshops in the last few months. Um, but we're really keen to move forward and do stuff. I love this idea of a kindness policy. Uh, I think it would be great. And also, if it's your passion, then yes, let's get involved and, and, and do that kind of thing. That would be great. Um, I also have a, a question that's related, I guess, to... Um, you mentioned uh, workplaces where kindness was most valued. Uh, education, healthcare, social work, things like that. And um, I was struck that those are also places where kind of burnout and uh, mental health of people working in them is quite, is quite difficult. And I wondered what, what is the link there and whether you can say anything about that? Yeah, it's such a good question. I had exactly the same reaction when I saw the results. I thought, oh, that's really interesting because what we often hear from people, and I did say it in my presentation, what we often hear from people working in those fields is, gosh, these are some of the most challenging environments to retain that value of kindness because it's, as you said, it's uh, that, that kind of environment where actually burnout can occur. And there is something really interesting about that. When you're being kind and compassionate and you've got that overarching focus on the human relationship when you're coming up against a system that seems to make it difficult 
it can lead to a real sense of burnout, just exhausting. And actually, you know, I talked about self-kindness earlier, about being kind and compassionate to ourselves. I think that's a key factor as well, because so much attention goes on actually doing the compassionate thing and the right thing and caring for others and so on, that sometimes you can neglect yourself and you end up not being compassionate and kind to yourself. And I think that's a really important factor in staff well-being in schools, in social work, in healthcare as well. So I 100% agree with you. To my mind, that then raises two immediate questions for what we're going to do. One, which is kind of a more reactive one, but really should become a proactive strategy. That is, how are we going to support staff well-being? How are we going to give attention to the staff members and how they're feeling and make sure that they are able to look after themselves and that we being, you know, the kind of, uh, if, if it is leadership in an organization or so on, that we're in a position to be able to support that uh, well-being for the staff members. So that's one point. And then the other point about uh, moving forward in this area that I think is really important is how do we begin to challenge the system? What is it about the system that is actually acting against kindness? And I didn't have time to show this, but um, can I draw your attention to a lovely piece of work by uh, Julia Unwin um, for the Carnegie UK Trust. I, I did a lot of work with Carnegie UK Trust a few, it was before COVID, maybe 2018, something like that, um, because Carnegie UK Trust has done some really lovely um, uh, workshops and uh, network events around kindness. And Julia Unwin wrote a, a policy, uh, sorry, wrote a pamphlet which was all about kindness in public policy. And she talked about kindness and relationships being a blind spot in public policy. And she makes the point that we have to weigh up kindness and relationships and well-being with so many complicated drivers in public policy around value for money, around trying to do the best we can with limited resources and being as efficient as possible with making sure that we have really good scrutiny of processes. And the problem is that quite often, kindness and relationships and mental health just lose out. They kind of end up taking a back seat because the drive for efficiency, the drive for value for money gets sort of pegged to other things, gets pegged to other outcomes and kindness doesn't get a look in. And what Julie Unwin's pamphlet does is say, actually, that is counterproductive. Because ultimately, it's like what I was showing in that first slide when I showed how it's connected to performance outcomes and so on. Ultimately, the relationships and the mental health and the well-being are fundamentally important for long-term performance outcomes. So, as I said, the two things are we need to think about staff well-being and we need to give specific attention to it in all of those settings in healthcare, education, social work and so on. And then the second thing is, how do we get a different focus in our system so that we take the long view and we don't just look at short term targets where kindness gets you know, knocked out as a secondary import of secondary importance, but we take a longer view and we think about what makes the difference in the long run in terms of performance outcomes. I, I have to say political pressures don't help here because everything is on a short time scale. And that's one of the real challenges in this area. But whatever we can do as a community to come together to say, let's take the long view, let's take the bigger picture about what's going to work in the long run. I think that's the better, you know, that's the better approach for us. going to say I think that very much applies to any any working environment or community that um, you know schools really need to be a kind environment but any working place absolutely needs to step back and recognize that the value of us all looking after each other as workers um, together and that we're actually going to achieve a lot more doing that and as leaders we need to try and resist and shield people from that upward or downward pressure for other number crunchers wanting 
us to move to ultimate efficiency and throwing the baby out with the bathwater. But um, it's a very focus to have. Yeah. Hundred percent. I uh, first of all, I'd like to say thank you so much for a very insightful um, discussion and talk today. Um, I have a couple of questions. Um, in your well, in your research, is kindness something that is innate to us that we are born with, or is it something that we learn from other people? That's my first question. And my second. Okay. My second question is, do we have any examples of kindness in the animal kingdom, in the animal world, rather than amongst humans? It's a, it's a really good question. And actually, the, the answers are related to each other, because there is a whole host of work focused on the evolution of altruism. Right? There's a huge literature on that in the animal world. There is undoubtedly an evolutionary foundation to kindness. So when you ask about is kindness innate to us, the propensity to be kind is absolutely there. There's no doubt about it. However, it's very important to recognize that we don't just come into the world with a sort of fixed quantity of uh, kindness and that's your lot. Actually, the environment matters hugely. So it's like, to be honest, in most things in psychology, you've got the role of nature and the role of nurture and the two interacting with each other as well. We look at, when we think about child development, we think about nature with nurture. We think about how infant temperaments, right? Babies come into the world with different temperaments which are inherited. The temperaments make a difference to the quality of the interactions that they experience, right? The, you know, if you've, got a, if you've got a baby that's very, very hard to settle, um, is very irritable, not easy to soothe, doesn't get into sleeping routines or feeding routines very easily, of course you're going to have a different experience as a parent, right? You, you're going to behave in different ways than if you've got a, uh, if you've got a baby that's kind of uh, um, very easy to settle and uh, very easy to comfort and so on. So it's about how nature and nurture interact with each other. And it's just the same with kindness. Of course, children are going to come in with different qualities, which are kind of uh, innate, if you like, which are inherited. There's a genetic foundation to them. I would say every single one comes in with the propensity for kindness, but they will come in with different personalities, different temperaments and so on. What then happens in the social environment, in the family, in the school, in the community is hugely important as well. And this isn't about just kind of, um, it's not just coming up with a blanket judgment about what a parent is like or what a school is like, or what a community is like. It is much more nuanced. It's about what's going on for that individual in that particular social group, in that particular social context and that particular time. And social influence is really fascinating. Once you start to unpack it, you realize that a child's level of kindness could be influenced by environments that they don't directly interact with at all. So for example, the classic example when people do this research on what we call social ecologies is the parent's workplace. Now the child might never set foot in the parent's workplace, but the parent's workplace could make a very big difference to the level of experience that the child has in the social world. Because a parent experience, sorry, the parent's workplace is influencing the parent's experience is making a difference to their mental health and their well-being and making a difference to their social relationships. And that in turn is going to then feed into the interactions that they have with the child. So you've got all of these complexities about the social world that children inhabit. And that includes environments which they never directly encounter themselves, but which are encountered by other people in their lives and then feed through into the child. So sorry, that's a very long way of answering the question. But my point is that, yes, of course, there's a strong genetic and evolutionary foundation for kindness. But every child has a unique story of the complex social world that they have to navigate. Um, and those influences are really important, too. Uh, and also to add to that, um, the I think it's on. Um, yes, for the, the thing about the animal kingdom too, there's, there's a guy called Ed Wilson, who uh, has written a book called, um, or loads of books, but 
uh, one called Human Nature. He's talking also about um, those animals which are kind in the same way that we are. Um, but one, one thing that he, he brings out and which I think is central to what we're talking about today is that there's two, uh, two forces going on with, within us. We're, we're essentially tribal in nature. And the, tribe, the tribes tend to be normative. They want everyone to behave in the same way. And within those tribes, we can be very kind, you know, we're, we're within a tribe. The, the challenge I think we have is, how, because we're not living in tribes anymore in this type of culture, is how can we be kind to people who are different? And um, I think that's much more difficult. It goes against our evolutionary nature in some way. Well, it's, it's a very, very interesting question. It's actually a really um, controversial area when you start to look at the evolution of uh, these processes. Um, so we won't get into it in, in, in a huge amount of detail now. But what I did want to emphasize was that the boundaries that demarcate our in-groups and out-groups are not fixed. They're not static. They can change. And we can change them. We can actually influence them ourselves. We can be very conscious about where our boundaries are for in-group and out-group. And it's quite interesting because you're right. If we don't think about it and we don't pay attention to it, we can end up, again, kind of ironically, with kindness and empathy and compassion actually leading to more division because what you're ending up doing is you're directing it all to, well, let's put it frankly, the people we like, the people who we think are similar to us. And we focus on people in our in-group. And that can actually have a counterproductive effect on kindness, sorry, counterproductive effect on well-being, because actually what you're doing is you're just sharpening the divisions between different groups in society. And we're being all lovely and kind and empathic and compassionate, but only to the people who we feel are just the same as us, who share the same values as us, who are similar to, maybe even the people who look similar to us, right? And that can happen if we're not careful. And we have to take the challenge head on about, them, uh, about this sort of separation of us and them. What are our in-groups and out-groups? Can we consciously consider a more inclusive approach where actually we're redefining the boundaries of our in-group? Instead of having us versus them, we're actually incorporating the them into the us. That's the challenge that we've all got to face so that we don't end up inadvertently just accentuating social divisions, that we're specifically focused on embracing difference and diversity, that we're particularly on the lookout for when there is difference, when there are people who are not like us, who don't have the same views as us, who look, sim who look different from us, who have a completely different background, who have very different takes on fundamental issues, how do we incorporate them into our in-group when it comes to kindness, empathy, and compassion? It's a, to be honest, it's a really challenging question, but it's something I'm really glad that you mentioned it, really good question. Oh, hi, so on the subject of in-groups and out-groups, I wonder if the folks in this room are in-group, do you think we are? Um, so, so anyway, um, can you have a kind tank um, battalion commander? Can you have a kind hedge fund manager? Can you have a kind um, oil driller? Do, do you see what I mean? There are, there are groups that we, folks like us, could assume do not share our values. They love their children, presumably. They're kind to them. Are, are they kind? I mean, genuine. I know this is it's a slightly mischievous question, but um, can you have a kind military operative whose job is to kill people with a missile? Well, you're asking a tough question here, but it's a really important one. I mean, the first thing I'd say is, just like I was talking about mental health and well-being, I'd resist the temptation to just describe kindness as a fixed dispositional quality of a person. So you're asking the question, can that person be kind? How can you have a kind military commander or a kind hedge fund manager, I think was the other example you used. 
And my point is, hang on a second, that's almost like attaching a label to the whole person. And I think we need to be really cautious about doing that because then we end up going down a rabbit hole, really, in terms of what does it mean to be kind. And I don't think kindness is such a simple thing that you can just say, here's a person, are they kind or are they not kind? I don't think it works like that. Because actually the truth of the matter is that kindness is nuanced and it's context, it's context specific very often. And even in one given interaction, one given behavior, it's not very easy to say, was that the kind thing to do or not a kind thing to do? Because actually you can immediately say, well, it depends, doesn't it? Do you mean kind to that person or do you mean kind to everybody else? Maybe something is kind for that person, but it might be actually quite unfair to lots of other people. Do you mean kindness in the short term or do you mean kindness in the long term? So maybe something, you look at a behavior and you think, well, yeah, that is kind right now. But in the long term, is that going to do that person any favors? Is that really going to be the benefit for the other person in the long term? And so you can get to a situation where you say, well, actually, same behavior could be interpreted quite differently. And I always say, it's asking the question that's important. Don't rush to come up with a judgment that this is the kind thing to do or this is not the kind thing to do. It's working together to even ask the question, is this the kind thing to do? And to explore those nuances, to explore those differences. When you say, well, it depends, I'm not sure. That process is really important. And to my mind, of course, there's going to be challenges where you're saying, well, hang on a second, this is a situation where you're being very adversarial and you're, you know, you're effectively in a fight, right? One person wins, one person loses. That happens in life. It happens in sports, right? Sports team, there's winner and loser. But are we saying then that kindness can't exist in a context where there's competition? Are we saying that kindness can't exist in a context when one person is trying to win and so is the other person? In my view, that is probably not correct. I think that whatever the context, even when we're talking about adversarial circumstances, we can be asking questions about kindness. We can be asking questions about compassion and empathy. When you take that bigger view, when you're asking the questions about what's right in the short term, what's right in the long term, what's right for this person, what's right for everybody else, all of those kinds of considerations, but you've got to answer, you've got to ask the question. And so much of the time in life, we don't even ask the question. And that's when I think we lose the kindness. Yes, hello. Uh, my name is Graham Burgess. I just just going back to the uh, the idea of the um, the kindness of strangers. I mean, many cultures in the world still have the kindness of strangers ethos, where that is to considered an honour and a privilege to to show hospitality. Sometimes extravagant hospitality yeah. to strangers who may well look like uh, somebody that not look like their group, uh, have completely different backgrounds and everything. I mean, maybe this is a tradition. Maybe it, maybe it used to exist here. I don't know, but I think it's it's almost like um, it's a culture. It's kind of a habit in a sense, and and we seem to have lost that very largely here. I mean, like I'm sure a lot of people here, when we were younger, we used to hitchhike everywhere because it was free and easy and actually interesting. I mean, nobody does that anymore. So. The, the habit of, of showing that kind of kindness to people or daring to go out and trust, uh, trust other people has, has disappeared. So I hope we're not going backwards, but some, in some respects, I wonder if we're not. That's a really great question. I'm really glad you asked that because I was telling you before that we um, have been really developing the research center on kindness at Sussex. We have a new director, uh, Dr. Gillian Sandstrom, 
who is a social psychologist who does lovely work and particularly lovely work in this area that you're mentioning about what sometimes in research is called minimal social ties the, or the weak ties in our social life, particularly things like talking to strangers. And you're absolutely right. There has been some movement over the years. History has led to some changes, or we've seen some changes over the course of history in, uh, in relation to how we engage with strangers. And sometimes the kind of fear and suspicion that can lead people to actually separate from each other um, and not join together. But it's not true that it's gone completely. And actually, it's also not true that it's happening in the same way all across, well, all across the UK, let alone all across the world. Actually, you see differences even now across different parts of the UK in how engaged people are with strangers and the relationship that people have with each other. They're really interesting patterns. We asked about this actually in the kindness test and it did, in fact, it did turn out that um, people experienced more kindness engaging with strangers. And I thought it was a really fascinating thing. And of course it does, because again, it's about bringing human beings connected with, or making human beings connected with each other. Um, and sometimes the connections are very weak connections. Sometimes they're not like, we're not developing, um, you know, strong emotional relationships, but even those weak social connections might be really important for us and they're connected with our experience of well-being and it fosters a sense of trust in each other, trust in humanity, which then inspires more social connections. So I, I'm glad that you asked the question and I would say don't be too disheartened because I don't think we're on a slippery slope to uh, um, people becoming completely isolated and not connecting with strangers at all. Actually, there's a lot of really positive things happening out there and I would say, please do check out the work from Gillian. And I, and I, I will, um, uh, Simon, I'll send through a link to uh, a, an event that we've got going where Gillian will be speaking. The work on talking to strangers and engaging with strangers is actually another example of really life-affirming kindness. And we've seen it again and again. And that includes people in uh, big urban areas in England. Um, I don't know... What, I mean, I, I want to turn the question on to you. What is it like in Froome? What is the experience of engaging with strangers, talking with each other? Does it happen or are people too reserved? I'm curious to know. Well, I nearly didn't get here today because as I was walking up Catherine Hill, I bumped into this guy who saw this sign and he was um, from another country he couldn't read it properly and he said oh my name is in there and it was his name was greg and it was the congregational oh. so we had a little chat and all of a sudden i was walking up past shepherd's button to come here and then i went oh wait a minute i'm good and i just paused and i rested for a moment and said no this conversation needs to carry on happening Oh, that's so lovely. That's a life affirming story, isn't it? It's about the social connections. And we did see loads of examples of people. I think when we asked about, so I may be wrong in saying this statistic, but I think it was something like this. When we asked people, all those 60,000 people, when was the last time you experienced kindness from someone else? I think it was as much as 10%, maybe even slightly more. It was something like that, but you know, not an insignificant amount. It was about 10% of the time people said the last time they experienced kindness was actually from a stranger. So there is, you know, and that was thousands and thousands of incidents. So lots and lots of people are talking about kindness with strangers, to and from strangers. So I have a, a wish vision, something for us here in our community is you've got your 50,000. How bad if we have a place where we can ongoingly celebrate these moments that yes. happen many times a day and reveal ourselves, including the selves that I have where I'm not, I'm not kind. And yet my unkindness is touched by other people's kindness, even though I no longer hitchhike. So um, we need to, I think, begin to wind up now. I'd just like to invite Helen and Bill to, to just uh, uh, offer a, a concluding comment, maybe in relation to the question that Robin just asked, and how's, how are we doing with kindness in fruit? 
So I think I've taken two big messages from you. Let's all notice that kindness and the opportunities to be kind. Um, and let's make sure that we build a culture in Froome where we can enable everyone to benefit and to take part in that. That's lovely. Thank you. Yep. Uh, yes, and I, I agree with that. Um, but I also think that like that some of these people have been talking about the children in schools, maybe that initiative needs to come from parents and from individuals in the community rather than relying on the institutions because the institutions are very um, are driven by politics. It's very hard for them to incorporate the things that you've been talking about, Robin. So well, I'd thank you very much. I'd Thank say you very much for that, because I, I, I would say, actually, there is a lot of work going on in those sometimes challenging contexts. Um, and, you know, we, we heard from uh, uh, um, other people in the audience how challenging school contexts can be sometimes. But there is a lot of work going on, which I think is quite affirming, which shows that people are taking this very seriously. There's some lovely work on kindness in schools, um, and it would be great to see that developing. I'm really delighted to hear that the Good Heart um, workshops are happening in schools. That's a really important step. And uh, let's see whether we can grow that even further. I think it's really important work. And uh, all of you, I think, from the really brilliant and thoughtful and insightful questions, I think it gives me great hope. All of you are showing a real passion for uh, building that culture of kindness. So uh, really good luck with it. And please do stay in touch with me. I'd love to hear how everything goes. I really hope you enjoy the week ahead uh, with the Kindness Festival and then don't let it, don't let it sort of uh, fall away after that week. Use that as a launch pad for kindness in Froome. Brilliant. <laughs> Thank you. Just to add a final comment, uh, Robin, uh, in answer to your question about how we're doing on kindness and Froome, uh, one figure that jumped out, I'm sure, from uh, in your presentation to all of us was the the area of public life in which. Uh, kindness is least valued is politics <laughs> and in fact that, we had a rather unusual conversation in last year's uh, from kindness festival of about kindness in politics um, <clears throat> but um just to say that i'm not sure if you're aware of this but a few years ago several years ago uh, Froome collectively abandoned adversarial partisan politics and for the last 10 years or so the, the council has been made up entirely of independent people who see their job as supporting the growth of community in Froome. Wow. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great thing and it's continued now for three elections and there are quite a number of councillors and ex-councillors here tonight. So here we are sitting in Froome Town Hall discussing how to make Froome kinder and in and this is this is the the locus of politics within within Froome so so this is a good sign we have that, somebody, that, somebody I've got to say that I really I have heard the occasional unkind kind comment made by councillors but usually they're ignored so <laughs> <laughs> that really is a very 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 I, I, nice. I always judge, judge a, a, a lecture by by the three eyes have I have I received information have I received ideas and have I received uh, inspiration? And I think I speak on behalf of all of us. You have, you have delivered on all three magnificent oh. tonight. Uh, I can't think of a more interesting and powerful first ever Froome Kindness Lecture. And it's been a real privilege to have you with us tonight. Um, uh, just one, one thing to say, you've been looking at the back of our heads, but actually if you sit here, Helen is sitting just under, under the screen. And when she turns to the screen, it just looks like the two of you are having a, a conversation. <laughs> Anyway, thank you for coping up with the slightly, you know, for the with slightly unusual sort of dynamics of the of the, the exchange here. But, but I can let's just I think another round of applause for a remarkable lecture. Oh, thank you so much, everyone. That's so lovely. Thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for what you're doing. And it sounds like you've got just the right context in Froome with what's happening in the council to really foster that kindness in the community. So, uh, yeah, buck the trend, I think. Um, sounds like you're creating a really positive narrative about kindness in the community. So long may it continue. Please let me know if I can help in any way. 
and we hope that you'll be able to come here and experience it yourself one day. So thank you so much. Okay. And just a final comment is we started by asking people what your definition of kindness was. And Robin, you uh, gave us several, which were very helpful. The good hearts definition is it means choosing to do things which benefit other people in a spirit of goodwill and solidarity. So the last comment I want to make tonight is what is it that each person in this room is going to choose to do during this kindness week, which will benefit other people in a spirit of goodwill and solidarity. Let's get out there and do it. Thank All you. Right. Have a drink with us now. <laughs>